Chapter 6. What to do when the future scares you. A few years ago, my family and I moved to Ethiopia for six months while we completed an adoption. I can remember how hard it was to set my expectations. There was a period of time when I found it hard to sleep because I would worry about certain scenarios. For example, I had read that there were many people who would try to pickpocket foreigners. I began to imagine what it would be like to have my wallet stolen. What would I do? Would I race after the thief the minute I realized I had been robbed? What if I caught him and he didn't give it back? What would I do if I lost my passport or identification papers? My heart became an anxiety factory. I began to come up with action plans for different scenarios. I would keep my wallet in my front pocket. Maybe I would buy some pants with zippers on the side. If people still manage to get my wallet, then I could be ready by having phone numbers to contact in case of an emergency. Maybe I would keep my money split up in different places so these imaginary offenders couldn't get all of it at once. Imagination can be a gift, but it can also be a curse. We imagine what we will have to face in the future, and then our hearts and minds get involved in envisioning how we would respond to certain scenarios. Before we realize it, we are spending our time and energy responding to future scenarios that may never happen. Anxiety comes from an overactive heart and mind. The problem. We project our fears into the future. We project our fears into the future and then imagine what we would do if we had to face them. Several theologians have diagnosed this dynamic. In his book, Spiritual Depression, Martin Lloyd-Jones saw these principles at work with an overactive heart and mind. Our imaginations confront us and ask a series of scenario questions, such as, what if this or that should happen? And then the heart is startled into anxiety and begins to study those scenarios and react to them by saying, if that should take place, we shall have to make this arrangement or we shall have to do that. Many of us are familiar with the concept that having an overactive bladder causes you to go to the bathroom frequently. But where do we go with an overactive, anxious heart and mind? The Solution Look all the way ahead. When it comes to anxiety, we need to see the problem clearly. And the issue isn't that we look ahead, it's that we don't look all the way ahead. Instead of seeing things in light of eternity, we tend to focus our attention myopically on our immediate problems. We need an eternal perspective or we become short-sighted. Why stop halfway at a place of uncertainty and difficulty? It is not wrong to go there, but it is wrong to stay there. The thing you are worried about may happen, but it also may not. Either way, it is definitely not what we should set our sights toward. Our Heavenly Father is the author of our stories. He has already written every one of our days from birth to death. As the psalmist said, in your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139, verse 16. Go ahead and read that again. He has written an everlasting conclusion for us in which every chapter is better than the last. The future is brighter than we can imagine. The best is yet to come. The doctrine of heaven helps us not only die well someday, but also live well today. Imagine the hypothetical future scenario that would elicit fear. For example, what if persecution comes and you lose your job, your financial well-being, even your home? The writer of Hebrews wrote to people who were facing the third scenario. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 34 these Christians visited other believers in prison, knowing that by doing so, they opened themselves up to the same persecution, even the plundering of their property. But these Christians also knew how to look all the way ahead and see the good gift that they could not lose. In this life, we can rest in the peace that Jesus has already fought for us, and we can rest in the assurance of our future with him. Our present rest and our future rest come together in Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the same eternal perspective is as powerful today as it was in the first century. 
Not long ago I read Nick Ripkin's The Insanity of God and discovered this scenario story that shows what is happening to the persecuted church in China. The security police regularly harass a believer who owns the property where a house church meets. The police say, you have got to stop these meetings. If you do not stop these meetings, we will confiscate your house and we will throw you out into the street. Then the property owner will probably respond, do you want my house? Do you want my farm? Well, if you do, then you need to talk to Jesus, because I gave this property to him. The security police will not know what to make of that answer. So they will say, we don't have any way to get to Jesus, but we can certainly get to you. When we take your property, you and your family will have nowhere to live. And the house church believers will declare, then we will be free to trust God for shelter, as well as for our daily bread. If you keep this up, we will beat you, the persecutors will tell them. Then we will be free to trust Jesus for healing, the believers will respond. And then we will put you in prison, the police will threaten. By now, the believer's response is almost predictable. Then we will be free to preach the good news of Jesus to the captives to set them free. We will be free to plant churches in prison. If you try to do that, we will kill you, the frustrated authorities will vow. And with utter consistency, the house church believers will reply, Then we will be free to go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. Jesus tells us not to be anxious about food and clothing, because all these things will be added to us as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus is describing the normative pattern of daily life. These things will be added to us, but persecuted believers know that in this world they can also be taken away from us. We may experience tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. The promise is not that we will never have to face these things, but that God's love cannot be taken away. These things cannot separate us from God's love. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Romans chapter 8, verse 37. Therefore, we can share in Paul's certainty. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. I love that Paul adds, nor anything else in all creation, Whenever our anxious, overactive hearts and minds make us dwell on the uncertainty of the future, we can face those insecurities and ask, Is this part of the anything else of Romans chapter 8 verse 39? The answer is yes. God promises that no matter what we face in life, it will not be able to separate us from the Father's love in Christ. When we have an eternal perspective that has read ahead and knows how the story ends, it enables us to go back to the chapter that has us stuck. We do not put our hope in a better version of ourselves that can handle the future versions of our problems. Instead, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 20, verse 7. We are not on our own. God is at work. The grace needed to take us to heavenly glory will be there for us every day. If we are justified, then we are also glorified. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. We are not orphans left to fend for ourselves. When we call out to our Father, He is there to listen. New Morning Mercies Why do we write our Father and His grace out of the story our imaginations have created for us? If we imagine hypothetical trouble, why do we have a hard time imagining guaranteed grace to go with it? We look at the future and act as if our troubles will be there, but God's grace will not. We lose heart when we borrow tomorrow's trouble without also factoring in tomorrow's mercies. Jesus analyzes our anxieties in the same way. He said, Do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 When we are anxious, we are borrowing trouble from the future and adding it to today's trouble. We have an inborn tendency to look at the sum total of what we can see coming at us 
potential or actual, and treat it like a lump-sum loan. We walk around feeling bankrupt because at any point we could be called to account and be declared bankrupt. We have forgotten about the certainty of guaranteed grace, described in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21-24. through 24. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. Did you see why we can hope? God's love and His mercies do not run out. They are new every morning. We become discouraged when we take the way that God works out of the equation. He does not give us a handful of grace upon our salvation and then ask us to use that amount a little at a time for the rest of our lives. No, God gives us what we need every day. His love and mercy never ends. He gives us an endless supply that never runs dry by making deposits of grace in our lives every morning without exception. Great is His faithfulness. Think about the foolish borrowing we do. We borrow trouble from tomorrow and try to pay for it with the grace we have for today. Of course, there is not enough. God did not design it that way. He does not give us today the grace we need for tomorrow. Grace is like breathing. We cannot take in enough breath to cover what is needed for tomorrow. Likewise, we cannot eat enough food today to last the next few months. Breathing and eating are daily realities. Grace is the same way. A fresh supply of God's all-sufficient grace will arrive tomorrow for us to face tomorrow's troubles. Cast your cares on the Father. Anxiety can sometimes be a form of arrogance. Pride tells us to carry our cares on our own instead of casting them on our Father. That is why the Bible says we humble ourselves by casting our cares on Him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6-7 through seven. Bring your cares to Him in prayer. God's peace is the solution for an overactive, anxious heart and mind. Look at how Paul described this practice in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6-7. through seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice that we should bring our petitions to God with thanksgiving, which can come only when we bring our Father back into the story. We should be thankful that God has not abandoned us to try to live this life on our own. Instead, He has promised to always be with us and to care for us. I can remember when my daughter was learning to give to God financially. The lessons started with tithing. One week, she decided to put all of her money in the offering plate. I told her that it was fine to give all her money to God, but she did not have to do so. She could keep some. She just looked at me for a moment and then said something that has always stuck with me. Why do I need money? I have a daddy. I have come back to this precious reminder time and time again. Why am I so worried? I have a father. That is why the Bible gives us a tender incentive for giving our cares to God. Cast all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 Jesus said that we are surrounded by examples of our Father's care every day. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Matthew chapter 6, verses 26-33. through 33. In this passage, Jesus gave us two examples of God's attentive care for His creation, birds and flowers. Don't let the familiarity of this passage cause you to miss how ridiculous the word pictures really are as we look at the birds and the flowers. Consider the birds. Let's consider the birds first. Jesus said, They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. This point is stunningly obvious. No one has ever seen a sparrow driving a tractor with a tiller cultivating the field. A crow has never been spotted driving a combine to gather the harvest. You never see them planting or gardening. Birds don't sow seeds, they eat them. How do the birds get food if they don't sow and reap? God takes care of them. Look at how God reminds Job of his promises in Job chapter 38, verses 39 through 41. Can you hunt the prey for the lion, or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens, or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? God goes on to confront Job with his supernatural care of the goats, the donkey, the bull, the ostrich, the war horse, and the eagle. God's glory is on display in the way that he cares for his creatures. God's point in the book of Job is to mercifully tear Job down from his lofty palace of pride. His point in Matthew is to lift us up from wallowing in the mud puddle of worry. So Jesus drives his point deep into the anxious hearts of his disciples. Are you not of more value than they? Matthew chapter 6, verse 26. The answer is, of course you are more valuable than they are. Jesus' rhetorical question uses a vertical scale of God's care toward his creation. Where do we rank in terms of God's care for his creatures? Birds are on the scale somewhere. I don't know what is below them. Maybe slugs? But we do know what ranks far above both. We do. Humanity is the crown of God's creation. Consider the flowers. Jesus also tells us to look at the flowers of the field. Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verses 28-29 through 29. Do you see his point? You never see flowers with a needle and thread or a sewing machine. They never have to knit or crochet. How do they have such a beautiful outer appearance? Because God clothes them. Even Solomon, perhaps the wealthiest man in the ancient world, could not dress himself as extravagantly as God dresses up the flowers. Give me a tulip festival over a royal processional any day. Jesus gently confronts us as he describes the way God clothes the flowers. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Verse 30. Jesus' rhetorical question uses a horizontal scale of longevity. What is the lifespan of a flower? It lasts longer than a fruit fly, but is much shorter than the lifespan of a human. The fact that humans live longer than flowers says something about God's great love for humanity. Will he devote less of his time and energy to something that he made in his image to last forever than he does to something he made that lasts only for a little while? Consider the cross. The end of Matthew's Gospel shows us the full extent of God's care. Jesus used the example of God's care of birds and flowers to show us God's love. The Gospels end with a focus on Jesus' death and resurrection as a demonstration of his love. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verse 16. Yes, nature proves that God cares for his creation, but the Gospel is also the greatest proof of God's care for us. There is no plan of salvation for birds or flowers, how much more is God's love and care displayed for us on the cross? When we come to God with our thanksgiving and our petitions, we experience His promise of peace. 
He has not promised to fix our circumstances. Peace is not the absence of difficult circumstances. It is the presence of the Prince of Peace. He often deals with difficult circumstances, not by taking them away, but by giving us more of himself. Worldly peace is something that we achieve and we guard. But God's peace is given. We don't guard it. It guards us. Trust God with tomorrow. I still remember the moment that these truths took hold of my heart with life-changing power. I was sitting in the sanctuary at a Wednesday night gathering at Bethlehem Baptist Church in April of 2009. We were watching a video about the persecuted church. In the video, we saw radical Muslims break into a Christian assembly of worship and put guns to the heads of the believers, demanding, Renounce Christ or die. The Christians did not renounce Christ, even in the face of death. So they were shot. My mind and heart jumped into hyperdrive, not just overactive, but hyperactive. I wondered and worried in the quietness of that moment, would I be able to do that? After the video, Pastor John Piper came to the microphone and said, Many of you are wondering if you could do that. He certainly had my attention. Piper continued, The answer is no. You could not do it today because you have not been called to do it today. But if and when that day ever comes, God's grace will be there so that you can. When your imagination takes you into uncharted territory, bring these truths with you. God is the author of your story. Open God's word and read ahead. The best is yet to come. When tomorrow arrives, God's grace will be there to take care of tomorrow's troubles. Let's take our cares to God and trust Him to calm our overactive hearts and minds and guard them with His peace.